Hello, I'm Brenda Talent, the CEO of the Show Me Institute. The Institute's pleased to bring you today's program on inflation in America, the role of the Fed and the risk of recession. For those of you who don't know, the Institute is an independent research and education organization. We focus on Missouri fiscal and economic policies from a free market lens. You can learn more about us at showmeinstitute.org, on Facebook at Facebook backslash Show Me Institute, or on Twitter at Show Me. We're gonna be taking questions during this program. To ask a question, look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, click on the Q&A button, Q&A, not the, not the chat button, and you can type your questions. Zach Lawhorn of Show Me Opportunity will be our moderator today. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Aaron Hedlund and Tyler Goodspeed. Aaron Hedlund, from my perspective, first and foremost, is our chief economist. Aaron also is a tenured associate professor in the economics department at the University of Missouri, Columbia, as well as a research fellow at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Beginning this fall, he'll be a tenured associate professor of economics and real estate in the Cranert School of Management at Purdue University. From 2020 to 21, Aaron was the chief domestic economist and senior advisor at the White House Council of Economic Advisors. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania and his bachelor's in economics and mathematics from Duke University. Tyler Goodspeed is the Kleinheim Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. From 2020 to 21, he served as acting chairman and vice chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, having been appointed by the president as a member of the council in 2019. Before joining the council, Dr. Goodspeed was on the faculty of economics at the University of Oxford and was a lecturer in economics at King's College, London. He received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Harvard University, and he received his master's in philosophy from the University of Cambridge, where he was a Gates Scholar. I want to thank all of you for joining us, and now I'm going to turn this program over to Aaron Hedlund. Aaron? Thank you, Brenda. Well, I'm pleased to be here with my former colleague and boss, Tyler Goodspeed, uh, to discuss really the issue that's in everybody's minds, which is why are prices going up so quickly? How did we get here? And where are things going? So let me just kind of give a brief landscape, kind of put some numbers to what everyone's feeling whenever they go to the store. And so the, the latest inflation numbers, this consumer price inflation, was 8.5%. That is the highest number that we have had since 1981. So this is a long time that we've not seen inflation numbers remotely like that. Typically, in recent years, inflation's been more like 2% or even lower. And you might hear some things about wages going up as well, but when you look at purchasing power, the real wage right, is gone, actually gone down by almost 3% since this inflationary episode began which amounts to an inflation tax of nearly $1,200. That is lost purchasing power that people don't have, which is especially harmful to the poor and seniors on fixed incomes. If you look at producer prices, those are rising even faster. And the Fed has now been talking about taking action. We've heard about recent rate increases. And what we've seen is markets respond quite a bit to that already with mortgage rates going up at the fastest pace since 1994. I'm going to turn it over to Tyler Goodspeed to give an even broader view of the landscape and where things might be headed. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks, Aaron. It's, it's good to see you, Aaron. And, and I have to just say, Aaron was on the Council of Economic Advisors. Aaron was someone who just had a, a, an enormous and unequaled capacity for work. I mean, he would be, he would be calling and, and emailing late into the night and still producing peer reviewed academic research on the side. I just, I don't know where, where he got the intellectual bandwidth, uh, but it's, it's, it's good to see you again, Aaron. Yes, yeah, so I think in the past year, we have basically run a very compressed rerun of the late 1960s and the early 1970s. So the, the late 1960s was when inflation started to become a problem the Fed sort of lost control of inflation expectations such that when a major supply shock hit in 1973-74, there was nothing to prevent prices from immediately moving upward. 
And so I think that's what happened in 2021. Those inflation, people's expectations of where prices were going to go started to, to inch up. And then, you know, we, we get hit with this major adverse supply shock. But I think it's, it's instructive to maybe look at the timing of the, 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 the shifts in inflation in the United States, because we, we've heard a lot over the past year that oh, it's, it's global in nature. And to a certain extent, that is true. Inflation has risen everywhere, but it's risen by substantially more in the United States than, than elsewhere. So if you look at 46 advanced and major economies that are track, tracked by the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the increase in the rate of inflation in the United States in 2021 over its pre-pandemic average was greater than in all of those 46 countries with the exceptions of Brazil, Turkey, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now, the, those, those, are not, those are not countries to which I look to for, for economic leadership. And if we look at sort of an apples to apples comparison, the Euro area is generally speaking a, a, a pretty similar economy to the United States. It's large, it's globally integrated, it's an advanced economy. And in the 12 months through February, 2021, Inflation in the United States and in the Euro area was pretty much exactly the same. It's actually slightly lower in the United States. Since February 2021, the increase in the rate of inflation in the United States was more than five times. So from February 2021 to Feb through February 2022, the increase in the rate of inflation in the United States was five times greater than that in the Euro area. And I think when you look at that, that timing, the key difference was in March 2021, we had a major fiscal spending bill equal to about 10% of the U.S. economy that just really turbocharged demand at a time when supply was still still in the process of recovering. Yeah, and so I think that timing is really important to highlight because when you hear the Biden administration and the president himself earlier today they seem to view this more as like a PR battle instead of an actual substantive problem to solve. So they've been calling it the Putin price hike. They've been blaming corporate greed. Apparently Trump's tax cuts years after passage suddenly stimulated inflation at the exact moment that the Biden administration passes its huge deficit spending stimulus bill. I mean, are people buying the spin or you know, what, can, you know, what should they be thinking is the actual underlying causes of the current inflation? Yeah, great question. There's, there's an old saying in Washington, that do, do they have a messaging problem or a problem problem? And I think when you look at polling data, I think American people recognize that there, it's a problem problem. And the causes are, to be sure, this, the, the supply side potential of the U.S. economy was constrained at, at coming out of the pandemic. There were supply chain issues, port issues, but I think that that's misplacing the blame for the inflationary pressure because our, our ports in 2021 actually handled an historic volume of goods. They, import volumes handled by U.S. ports in 2021 were about 20 percent above their 2019 levels. That's that's a lot. That's a lot of, of volume to be handling. And I think the, the key difference, the key factor in 2021 for why we saw this big spike in inflation was, as I said, in March 2021, we had a, a bill, the American Rescue Plan that, that Biden and Democrats in Congress sort of rammed through that was equal to about 10 percent of the entire output of the U.S. economy. So in, in March 2021, in one month, we saw consumer demand for goods increase by 10.7%. That's a, that's a 240% annualized increase in demand for goods. That's a lot. That is a lot of demand to be hitting a, a, a supply side of the U.S. economy that was still coming out of the pandemic. It's quite striking because I, I remember, so Larry Summers, and for, for people who don't know the name Larry Summers, he was a treasury secretary under Clinton and the director of the National Economic Council under President Obama. And when the bill was being debated and passed, he called it the most reckless 
macroeconomic policy he's seen in 40 years. And what do we see now? The highest inflation in over 40 years. So I don't normally sing Larry Summers' praises, but he was right on target when it comes to that prediction. So, you know, President Trump, and, you know, when I was there uh, working under you, and by the way, thank you for the compliment. Let me, let me say to everyone here, the Council of Economic Advisors is a really interesting unit within the White House because it's mostly academics. Uh, but Tyler Goodspeed as chair, not only was he brilliant in terms of his, his keen analysis, but he was extremely effective at making the case to others within the White House on good policy. So that was, I think, a tremendous service to the country. Uh, but President Trump, we, you know, we did a, a large rescue package then when the economy was in a big hole. You know, why was it that that seemed to be effective, whereas President Biden's actions in 2021 were very inflationary and not very effective? Yeah, great, great question. Because yes, there, there were, there was a, a two trillion dollar bill in March 2020, in March 2020, the CARES Act. I, I think the, the key difference is that the same sort of package is not going to be applicable in March 2021 as in March 2020. So in March 2021, we were about 11 months into a recovery. We had already by December 2020 recovered almost 60% of the jobs lost in those horrific months of March and April 2020. We had recovered about almost 80% of the decline in output, in the level of output in the United States. Whereas in March 2020, we had just lost over 20 million jobs. And the U.S. economy, the output of the U.S. economy plunged quarter over quarter uh, by 30%. So the, the package, the bill that, that we worked on in, in March 2020, the CARES Act, had a number of priorities. One was to help preserve some of the contractual relationships that existed on the eve of the pandemic. Most importantly, the, the matches of workers and employers because those, those, are, those are good matches between workers and employers. And if you allow them to become separated, then it can take a long time for workers to find new jobs, employers to find new workers. So we really prioritize trying to help employers keep people on, on payroll. So that's why we did this thing called the Paycheck Protection Program, which offered forgivable loans to employers if they use those, those loans to cover eligible payroll costs. Uh, we, we provided an employee retention tax credit, and this is something that Aaron worked quite a bit on and, and successfully got that expanded in subsequent relief packages. And then we also did a lot of things like we, we allowed businesses to carry back their net operating losses from 2020. So they, you know, they had a big loss in 2020. Usually they would, have, they would carry that forward to future years so they, they could get a tax refund on that loss. We said, well, given the, the circumstances, why don't you carry that back? so that you can get a tax refund, a tax credit today to help cushion the, 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 the adverse hit to cash flow. Um, and then also because you know, we were looking at over 20 million Americans losing their jobs all at once and consumer demand is about 70% of the US economy, there was the thinking that we should probably increase the usual 50% replacement for, for lost income under traditional unemployment insurance and that traditional unemployment insurance system was pretty creaking and some of the states were operating their IT systems on, you know, old, old, old. We've outdated. had many discussions of old state IT systems here in Missouri. That's yeah, for sure. And, and so that, that was why, the, in addition to the, the top up to unemployment insurance benefits, uh, a round of economic impact payments were sent out to households. But I think the, 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 key insight that we had at the time was these measures make sense when the U.S. economy is in a medically induced coma, but they do not make sense when you have a labor market recovery underway, when employers are trying to hire workers. And so that's why we made sure to introduce sunsets to all these provisions. So the unemployment insurance benefit top up was initially supposed to expire in July 2020. The economic impact payments were, were, were originally intended to be a one-off. The idea that those things made sense, you know, that it made sense to do an even bigger round of stimulus checks 
in March 2021 and to expand, extend that top up to unemployment insurance benefits to September 2021 just doesn't pass economic logic in my view. I agree. I, that such to me is the key difference. I like that the phrase that the, the medically induced coma, because essentially the idea was the economy kind of shut down in some cases because people were being careful themselves because of the virus, in some cases because of you know, government ordinances. And so the rescue, rescue package then was to kind of keep things on ice so that when the economy reopened, it wouldn't be reopening in a very damaged condition. But when you go to March 2021, the economy is open. You know, why in the world would we inject trillions of dollars when the economy was not in a trillions of dollars shortfall? Not to mention the uh, complete anti-work philosophy that was embedded in the, in the Biden stimulus bill, which, you know, extended unemployment benefits at a very high rate, uh, discouraging people to go to work, you know, the child tax credit, which they stripped out work requirements. Uh, so, yeah, it's a big change in philosophy that has created a lot of damage. So in the early months, when the Biden administration kind of passed this stuff and inflation started to show, there was kind of this denial phase, right, where it's like, well, let's just use cars or, or eventually it's it spread to other things like, oh, well, it's going to go away. It's transitory. How did they get it so wrong? I mean, a lot of people got it wrong, but how did they get it so wrong? Um, and do you think that people in, in government, like people who are actually leading the country right now, do you think that they recognize the severity of the situation and what to do about it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's puzzling to me because I remember writing pieces in March and April, 2021, warning about this, warning, warning that this is not just transitory and, and also highlighting early on that, as you pointed out, when you have big, surprise, big increases in inflation, it's really hard for worker pay to keep up with that because a lot of prices are adjusted at a much higher frequency than annual, annual salary contracts or annual wage contracts. So I, I think it was a combination of wishful thinking and, uh, in, and that intellectually many policymakers and policy observers were waging the last war. So the last war was the recovery from 2008, 2009, which was very slow. It was a very deep labor market uh, contraction and a very slow labor market recovery exacerbated by some pretty bad policy decisions at the time. And after 2010, there was a, there was a sequester, the congressional sequester. So fiscal policy was, was, a, was a net drag on growth in the United States. Monetary policy was expansionary, but with one hand, they were buying a lot of assets through their quantitative easing programs. But with another hand, they were paying banks to just park, park their capital at the Fed uh, as excess reserves. So monetary policy wasn't quite as expansionary as I think a lot of people thought at the time. So the Fed for many years in the previous expansion were, were actually struggling to hit 2% inflation. So I think that many people were conditioned by that old landscape. I also am surprised by the parallels. I, I noted earlier that, that this remind, the past year and a half has really reminded me of the, the late 1960s through the, the early 1970s. There's a great scholar of the, the history of the Federal Reserve and, and monetary policy, the, the late uh, Alan Meltzer. And I've, I've been re rereading his, his history of the Fed and the origins of the great inflation, the great inflation from 1966 to 1982 the rereading it a lot. And one, one quote of his actually really struck me. He, he writes, and I'll, I'll quote, this is, this is Meltzer writing in 2005. Policymakers denied for several years in the 1960s that inflation had either begun or increased. They did not deny the numbers they saw. Like Gardner Ackley, who was a member of President Kennedy's Council of Economic Advisors and then chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Johnson, like Gardner Ackley, they gave special explanations, a relative price theory of the general price level, in effect claiming that the rise in the price level resulted from, wait for it, one-time 
transitory changes that they did not expect oh, sure. to repeat. Later, they added other explanations, especially that the causes of inflation had changed from the classic demand pull to the new cost push. Does any of that sound familiar? Yeah, that's an outcher. Team transitory was, was around back then and they've, they've resurfaced now. So all right, let's, let's think about a, counter, a, a counterfactual scenario. This is you know, unfortunately not the reality, but suppose, you know, so the thing is when you were chair of the CEA, you were the guy who was going in to talk to President Trump in the Oval Office, telling him the latest data and how to think about it. Um, if you were in the White House today and you were briefing the president, and somehow he were actually agreeing to listen to you instead of being off in his own world with these kind of more strange ideas we're hearing. What recommendations, what insights would you give him now? Great question. And yeah, uh, oftentimes the, the, the interesting thing, so folks may not realize that, that a lot of economic data is delivered to the Council of Economic Advisors in a secure way before market release, usually the day before it's released publicly. And it's quite an operation to ensure, because if you, we, we would have to ensure that the data was, was only viewed in secure folders. Uh, and, and if it was in hard copy, it all had to be concealed and people had to sign non-disclosure forms. And, you know, I, 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 I don't know what the penalty was. I mean, maybe five years in jail, something, I don't know, but. And the CEA has never had a leak, right? Not to Shocking. my knowledge, the CEA has never yeah. had a leak. Yes, and correct. And then, so we we'll, we we get the data. We would get the data the day before, and we would try to analyze it, make sense of it. And then I would head over to the Oval Office, or sometimes if it was late at night, uh, it would be to the the, the residents or to the private the, the little study off to the side of the Oval Office. And uh, with, with my colleague, uh, Larry Kudlow would, would sort of go through the numbers and think about what they, what they think about what the president, what they, what they meant would mean and what the market reaction would be the next day. You know, if I were briefing President Biden today, I think I would be realistic about the limited tools that, that fiscal policy has at his disposal given that the, the cat's kind of out of the bag already, uh, in large part because of fiscal policy. Right. But I would try to be pointing to the, the levers he could pull, which include, okay, so we've, we've, we, we have a big labor shortage. And actually, the labor market has been struggling to match unemployed workers to vacant jobs. I would, I would be advising him to, to make permanent and signal that we were going to make permanent some of the reductions in marginal personal income tax rates that were introduced in 2017 in order to incentivize people to, to stay in the labor force or to re-enter the labor force, particularly older workers. So older workers tend to be pretty much more responsive to changes in marginal personal income tax rates. And a lot of older workers have left the labor force over the past two years. Yeah, it strikes me that the labor shortages and inflation are actually connected, right? If you get yeah. less supply, you're going to have these price pressures. Yeah, uh, so that would be one. And a second thing I would do also related to the 2017 tax law, which evidently he was just today denigrating or attributing uh, inflation to the 2017 tax law. But I think that there's, there's still a shortfall in business investment since the pandemic began. Last time I checked, it was about a half a trillion dollar cumulative shortfall in business investment. So that business investment in new plants, business equi- uh, investment in new equipment. And you know, when you don't have enough business investment, that means that your product, the productive potential of the US economy is gonna be smaller. So I would be advising him to stop instilling fear in the business community that higher corporate tax rates are going to be coming. I would signal, try to signal that you know, the, the, new, the full expensing of equipment investment. So right now under the, under the 2017 tax law, if you buy a new piece of equipment for your business, you can immediately deduct that from your, your tax liability. That starts to sunset after this year. If I, if I were advising President Biden, I would say, give businesses a bit of, a bit of certainty and say, yeah, we're, we're, we're gonna keep that in place to try and help this, this recovery. 
Yeah, I think those are, those are great pieces of advice because investment is such a forward-looking decision, right? So expectations about what the future are affect what people do today. Well, unfortunately, we know President Biden is not going to listen to the advice. Uh, before we pivot over to, to kind of questions from the audience, I do have one other question. So the only entity really left that can do anything and signaled finally that it will do something about inflation is the Fed. Do you think they can achieve a soft landing. Do you think they're taking the right steps now? So Aaron, if, if we look over the entire post-war period in the US, and I, I, I'm, I, it's, been a couple, it's been a while since I've, I've, I've double checked this, but uh, over the entire post-war period in the US, if, you, if we've had, if, if we have inflation over 4%, and the unemployment rate below 4%, there's about a 60% probability that in the next 12 months, a recession begins. And over the next 24 months, that, ri- that probability rises to about 100%. So the historical odds are not particularly favorable. Will this Fed have the resolve of Paul Volcker to bring inflation back down to their stated target of 2%. I'm, I'm skeptical because you know, we just learned yesterday from the New York Fed that consumers' inflation expectations, their long-run inflation expectations have risen by about 200 basis points relative to their pre-pandemic levels. Their year-ahead expectations have risen by about 400 basis points. So when inflation expectations have gone up by that much, 350 basis point hikes by the Fed in May, June, and July is, is not going to meaningfully tighten uh, real interest rates. And look, there were many instances in the 1960s and the 1970s when the Fed stated, look, we know inflation is a problem. We're going we're gonna to get it under control. We're going to tighten. And they started tightening. Until Paul Volcker, on each one of those occasions, they paused or U-turned. And, and Volcker even had a, U, a pause in there, a U-turn, actually. Um, And the median time from the start of one of those tightening cycles to a pause or a U-turn was about eight, was eight and a half months. Um, So, you know, I, I don't see, I don't see this, this federal open market committee being, having quite the, quite the resolve of Paul Volcker. Yeah. So it seems like the two key things that you're mentioning are the, the amount of increases, but then also sticking to it. Right. Not, not getting skittish as soon as something shows a sign of weakness. Yeah, I think that's, that's the big question. So I think now we can turn it over to uh, any questions that people may have. All right. Well, thank you both, Tyler and Aaron. Uh, first question. So Tyler, when you were just talking about the Fed, you used the word skeptical. Um, and we'll start with you. Do you think the Fed has a credibility problem right now? And if you do think they have a credibility problem right now, um, what does that mean moving forward and how can they kind of reestablish trust? Good, good question. So I, they, they do have a credibility problem, although I, I was actually just at a conference on Friday where five current and recent former members of the federal, the Fed's Federal Open Market Committee were, were present and speaking. And they seem to be of the view that that their forward guidance that they started giving that, you know, we're going to start tightening and they started indicating that back in November, they seem to be of the view that that forward guidance uh, add a lot of credibility with markets and, and credibility is intact. But look, if you, if, if you look at their economic projections over the past year, pretty much every, at pretty much every meeting, the lowest inflation forecast was still higher than the highest inflation forecast of the preceding meeting. I mean, that that just reveals a level of disconnect between members of the Federal Open Market Committee and and economic reality that that ought to strain strain credibility. And I I think it has. And it's not just their forecast for for inflation. I mean, they're, they're the, the revisions that they've had to make to their forecast for the unemployment rate have also been substantial to the Fed, federal funds rate. 
So I, I, I think that they do have a, a mounting credibility problem. And the reason that matters, because to a certain extent, it doesn't matter because bond markets aren't setting prices for, for goods and services. That's, that's households, workers, businesses. But it, if the Fed does lose its credibility, it means that they're going to have to be even more aggressive to meaningfully, substantially tighten financial conditions, because that, that is the channel through which the Fed impacts prices, is, is, or a main, main channel is through these, the, the, these credit and financial market conditions. And if, if, if no one buys the Fed, or the Fed statements, then they're going to have to be even tougher in order to, to enact some meaningful meaningful tightening through through financial channels. Aaron, you mentioned a, a soft landing, and last Wednesday, Chairman Powell said that a soft landing, and then he kind of corrected himself and said, "Well, softish uh, landing is one of their goals." Can you explain a little bit more what you mean by soft landing? Yeah, well, first of all, it sounds like a little bit of a different definition between when a passenger feels turbulence versus when the captain feels turbulence. When passengers feel turbulence that's pretty hard, that's actually still considered pretty mild by, by pilots. Like severe turbulence to a pilot is pretty horrible. So it does depend on whose perspective you're taking. I think when you take the perspective of workers and most families in the country, what does a soft landing mean? Soft landing means can you bring down inflation without causing a recession? Like, can you bring down inflation without the unemployment rate going up by any kind of measurable degree? Uh, can they do it? That's the big question. I mean, as, as Tyler mentioned, historically speaking, they have not been very good at that. And I think just to uh, piggyback off of his, the remarks Tyler just made, if the Fed is out there having to say, oh, yeah, we're, we've been ahead of the curve, you, you know that's a problem. Right? They shouldn't have to say that uh, to, to convince people. Right? People would, would kind of believe that if it were true. Okay, so Tyler, you were mentioning that uh, eventually there's gonna be a pause or a U-turn in raising the, the Fed funds rate. So is could part of the urgency in raising the rate be that you can't cut from zero? So that's why there's, you know, they added the meeting in July. And so you have to raise rates to be able to cut rates. Um, and so do you, do you attribute maybe some of the urgency to that? That, that is a, a, a logic and actually certainly in the, in the preceding expansion, there, there, there were some who said, yeah, you, we, we, we need to start getting this up so that we have room to cut in the event of the recession. I don't think that's a primary motivation at, at the moment. I think it is the, the, the main motivation is just that Inflation has risen from 2% to 8.5%. Inflation expectations by various measures have risen from, you know, by 2 to 4 percentage points. And so they need to start tightening. What actually surprises me is that they are following the playbook of the, of the previous war. Uh, so in 2010 to 2019, it made sense to, you know, give a lot of what they call forward guidance you know, signaling the markets, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, then gradually follow through. But when inflation has already risen, and already risen by this much, and inflation expectations have already risen, and already risen by this much, I'm struggling to see the logic behind continuing to do this, this, this gradual approach. I actually, I actually think they probably would have been better served to do a bigger increase, a bigger rate hike up front, and that would preserve a bit more optionality down the road. So Aaron, I'm not gonna ask you to predict the next recession, but- <laughs> Thank well, you. <laughs> um, so there's a technical definition of a recession and the first quarter was negative uh, 1.4 GDP growth. Um, is there such a thing as just a behavioral recession? Could consumers put themselves into a recession before we, we are in a technical recession? Yeah, I think that's a good point to mention, which is that you know, there is this kind of official definition, but you know, 90% of the population has no idea what that is, right? That's something that people who study this topic, they had to settle on a definition so they could do a kind of a standardized analysis over, over past events. And that, that technical definition is that you need to have GDP go negative, GDP growth be negative for two quarters in a row. So what that means is we have one, so we're halfway there. 
But if in the second quarter, GDP ends up being somewhat positive, but then in the third quarter, it turns negative again because of the rate hikes kind of kicking in, then technically we're not in, you know, we would have avoided a recession, even though practically speaking, everyone would feel like we're in it because the economy would be slowing down and unemployment rates would potentially be going up. So I think that's the big risk. Uh, consumer confidence is already declining. Right? It's been declining because of the high inflation that people are experiencing. They do not seem to have a lot of confidence that enough is being done. I think I saw a poll that like 80% of, of the people do not believe the government's doing enough to bring inflation under control. So that that's kind of puts us in a precarious position. Tyler, uh, in previous times of higher inflation, when a when the CPI starts to recede, so tomorrow, if we get a CPI print below 8.5, um, does it does the downtrend usually continue? Or if we get 8% or 7.9% tomorrow morning, um, is there any historical precedent for it to spike back up? Or does once it starts falling, does it usually continue? That's a really good question. And so first, first of all, I, I think we will see inflation come down in the, the coming months. Ironically, that will be in part due, in large part due to the, the same transitory factors, genuinely transitory factors that were elevating inflation in the first half of 2021 are actually going to be bringing inflation down a bit in, in 2022. So there, there are these base effects uh, from 2021. And then also things like used cars last month used cars uh, actually subtracted two tenths of a percentage point from the month over month change in, in, in CPI. So I, I think that there's gonna be some of that going on. In terms of more broadly, the, do we see inflation come down then go back up again? This, this is where I think that the issue of inflation expectations really comes into play. We, we heard throughout last year, the Fed saying, consumers inflation expectations are, are anchored. And the whole idea of an inflation expectations anchor is that, you know, you had this strong sense that you know, prices have always gone up by about 2%. So they're always going to continue to go up by 2%. Therefore, when a, when a, a random supply shock, like an oil embargo in 1973, 74 hits, if you have anchored inflation expectations. You can look through that and you can recognize, you know, this, this is a shock, but it's a temporary shock. It's going to pass and we're going to go back to 2% growth. And so you don't have to start pushing for higher wages. You don't have to start you know, renegotiating contracts with your suppliers if you're a business. The problem of the past year and a half is we've already lost control of expectations. Expectations have already gone up. You look at any survey of businesses, the ISM survey of manufacturers, all of the business surveys that the regional feds are conducting, and, and you just see it, the price pressures everywhere. And Aaron mentioned earlier up front, the, the, produce, the producer prices have been going up by more than consumer prices, which means that producers have been eating a lot of the, the, the cost. And I think that when you look at survey data, they are increasingly saying, we want to try, we're, we're going to have to try to get back some, some margin. So I think the conclusion of this is, yes, we can see inflation come down from what was probably a local maximum in, in, in March 2022. But so long as those expectations among both businesses and households are elevated, all it takes is another big supply shock for us to, to, to get another ratchet up. I mean, that's what we saw in the 70s, both with the 73, 74 shock, and then again with the 79 shock. Aaron, what do you think of the theory that maybe the stock market is doing a little bit of the, the Fed's business for them, you know, of the, the start of the year? Uh, it's been a a rough few months in the market, and that could have you know the wealth effect. That could have people uh, tightening up their budgets. Um, do you think that the Fed might have an idea in mind how much they're going to let the market run, and then they'll you know we've over the last uh, couple decades we've become accustomed to them stepping in and saying like, all right, we've hit the floor here. You know we're going to go back to QE, or here's um, a rate cut. Um, what do you think uh, they're thinking right now? Well, first of all, I don't think we're going to see a return to QE anytime soon, uh, especially as that pertains to the housing market. So uh, I'll, I'll get back to the stock market in just a moment. But you know, mortgage rates have gone up 
at the fastest pace since 1994, two percentage points, um, well, actually over two percentage points. And I think when I, when I tell people about the housing market, hopefully in a couple of years, rates will come back down somewhat. But I don't think we're ever going to see 2.6% mortgage rates. That was, that was largely because of aggressive QE in the, in the mortgage market. That we probably won't see a return to that anytime soon. As, as far as the stock market goes, I mean, the Federal Reserve likes to say, and I think it's mostly true, that they do not adjust their monetary policy decisions based on the day-to-day fluctuations in the stock market. Uh, I do think the Fed does not like to surprise the market. So that's why you've seen the Fed be kind of communicating, you know, giving signals about what they're going to do. So when they raised rates by half a percent the other day, no one really reacted much to that because the Fed kind of made it clear that's what they were going to do ahead of time. So they don't like to surprise the market. But as far as if the market keeps tanking, I don't think the Fed is going to suddenly do a U-turn based on that. Uh, will that do the Fed's job? To some extent. But I do think it's important to recognize that um, for most people, if they do have considerable exposure to the stock market, it's probably through their retirement accounts. So they're not really doing their day-to-day spending based on what the retirement account's doing as much, unless you're closer to retirement. And for people who are, are much more in the market, it tends to be just a, a smaller fraction of the population. I think what happens to the housing market may have a bigger impact. So if, if house prices slow down or come down, um, you know, that wealth effect it can be a larger one. So Tyler, I'm going to ask you just kind of an open-ended question. So feel free to take this anywhere that you'd like. But I remember in 2020, during the, the height of the pandemic, people, some people would say, man, after we get past this pandemic, it's going to be the roaring 20s again. Like you just wait, good times are ahead. Um, so what happened? Like here, <laughs> You're not feeling what, it? What, where'd we go wrong? Yeah, it was sort of the, the roaring first half of 2021. <laughs> I, I think it was just, it was never sustainable because so on the supply side, we were still, we were still in recovery. And then as, as Aaron hinted, the, the, the package that was passed in March 2021 actually exacerbated a lot of those supply side challenges by extending enhanced unemployment insurance benefits to September 2022, to September 2021, by eliminating work requirements on a massively expanded child tax credit. Uh, so that deterred the recovery in labor force participation. We also, for various reasons, had a lot of mismatch. I I noted earlier that there was a mismatch between unemployed workers and vacant jobs. Part of that was because we were still emerging from the pandemic. So you had very strong job growth and low unemployment in places like Florida and Texas, and still relatively high unemployment and more tepid job growth in places like California and New York, and workers can't easily move from, from one to the other. Uh, There were still 3.7 million Americans when the bill was passed, reporting that they didn't look for work in the past uh, four weeks because of the pandemic. So there were all these supply side issues going on. And then we just poured, as I noted earlier, we just poured a a massive increase in demand on top of that. So we had a 240% increase in demand for goods in the month of annualized rate of increase in, in demand for goods in the month of March alone. Uh, that's that's just a major mismatch, and that's why we had inflation expectations become unhinged and move up in 2021. And then, yeah, we we did have a major shock, adverse shock with Putin, with the Russian Federation's invasion of of Ukraine. It, it has likely pushed Europe into a recession. It has driven up commodity and food prices globally, and that has further exacerbated the the inflation problem. And the inflation problem itself is then necessitating not only tightening by the Fed that could tip us in, into a recession, but it's, it's forcing the Fed into a major regime change. Because think about it, for, for a decade, businesses operated in, a, in an environment of very low and very stable interest rates and very low and very stable inflation 
and investors operated in that environment as well. So the, the key question in my mind is, does a portfolio and does a, a business's capital structure or, or, or do a portfolio and capital structure that makes sense under a low and stable interest rate and low and stable inflation environment make sense in an environment of rising interest rates and high inflation. And I, I think that paradigm shift could get very ugly. So that I, that's where I think we got wrong, is that where things went wrong, is that the inflation problem that President Biden created and the Fed permitted is now making more likely a very disorderly resolution. Aaron, what does uh, raising rates, what does that mean for the federal deficit, for the federal debt? Yeah, so that's that's a big question to me kind of going forward, because um, I'd say that there's a saying by Milton Friedman, a very famous free market economist, who talks about inflation being always, I'm not going to exactly quote him, but basically a monetary phenomenon that's focused on money supply. Um, but then there's also another quote by another Nobel Prize winner, Tom Sargent, that points out that persistent high inflation is a fiscal phenomenon. Is one of them right, the other one wrong? No. The answer is when you have a lot of debt in the economy, then suddenly the Federal Reserve it almost has to think about it at least a little bit when they're setting their interest rates. Right? Both on the household side, the households have a lot of debt, and if rates go up, it makes it harder for them financially, and also for the government. Right? If interest rates go up, that makes debt servicing costs a lot higher. Now, thankfully, debt servicing costs, uh, the interest rate that pins that down is not the federal funds rate. So that the, the rate that the Fed directly controls does not translate one for one into debt servicing. But this goes to Tyler's point, which is that if people, if their inflation expectations become unhinged, if they think inflation's around for the long haul, then interest rates will indeed rise for the federal for federal debt. And that's going to make deficits even worse. And either get some kind of spiraling problem or, or there has to become some major fiscal correction, which is, I think, what, what needs to happen. But it just makes that that much more painful. Um, so, Tyler, could it be possible that the stimulus, one of the causes of this recession, is also one of the things that keeps the recession more on the mild end if we do get you know businesses are flush with cash the consumer uh may have some stimulus stimulus cash lives over so at least on the demand side things would hold up better um or is that the wrong way to look at it and that we're already having a demand side problem so that's only going to make it worse that's a that's a good question a good way of framing it so just to put some numbers on it over the course of three fiscal packages where the federal government sent out stimulus checks and for a year and a half was, was replacing lost income through the unemployment insurance at a much higher rate than 50%, uh, households accumulated over $2 trillion in, in sort of above trend savings. And that was a function both of, of saving some of those, those, those some of those transfers from the federal government, and then also in 2020 they reduced a lot of their purchases, particularly of services, even though goods demand for goods recovered very very quickly. So right now households are still in the aggregate sitting on about two trillion dollars in above trend savings, and that's why we've seen the, the savings rate tick down in recent months and recent quarters as 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 households start to spend down some of those saving balances. So I think you're right that, that household balance sheets, if we do enter a recession in the next 12 months, in the aggregate are probably going to be entering that recession in, in historically healthy shape. But there's, there are going to be differences across the distribution. Uh, so you know, folks, folks at the lower end of the distribution probably spent a lot more. Of, of those fiscal transfers. And so they have you know, less, less of a buffer than, than those in those say top 50% of the, the, the income and wealth distributions. Aaron, uh, what kind of economic indicators do you keep track of to um, for maybe recession signals? So we were talking about the used car index, you know, people reference commodities, you know, oil and lumber. 
Um, obviously, the CPI and core inflation. Are there any other indicators that you keep an eye on to uh, see how we're doing? Yeah, I don't think I have anything interesting in my in my set there. I mean, I look at kind of the a lot of the main data that people talk about. Um, I, I got housing starts as well, but again, sometimes housing does not always go with the rest of the economy. Uh, the question makes me think of Alan Greenspan because I think Alan Greenspan had very unique and peculiar peculiar things he would look at. Like he would look at the price of cardboard, I think, because if the price of cardboard fell, that meant people weren't shipping as much stuff and, or it was a signal that people weren't shipping as much stuff. And why aren't people shipping as much? Well, because maybe they're pessimistic or just, you know, they just have declines in economic activity. Uh, I don't have anything kind of idiosyncratic like that that I look at, uh, but it is something to, you know, I'm sure people are constantly in search for the next signal. All right. Well, um, we just have a few minutes left here, so we're going to move to wrap up a little bit. So, um, Tyler, I don't again, I don't want you to make a prediction, but it seems like over the last 45 minutes, the next six to 18 months, you're pretty sure that we could be in a recession. It seems more likely than not. Is that fair to say? I think that's that's a that's a fair way to put it. OK, um, so. It seems like each recession uh, is maybe its own special recession and is caused by um, its own factors. Once the recession begins, do we have any reason to believe that they play out the same, even if they maybe start for different, uh, are started by different catalysts? That's a good question. And I'm uh, and to, to your previous question, I, I'm was recently reminded of a comment by Larry Summers, who said that the, the Fed would be well advised to draw a lesson from Volcker and Greenspan and, and speak sometimes in a more oracular way, like the, the oracles of Delphi. They would, they would, they would give their prophecies in, in rather vague terms uh, so that it was often difficult for them to be disproven. And his point was that the, the Fed, to your credibility, your, your observation about their, their credibility challenge, the Fed has taken to giving very precise predictions of the future. And when those very precise predictions of the future turn out to be wrong, and in the cases of inflation, very wrong, that, that doesn't do much for their credibility. Uh, in terms of, yes, I mean, each, each recession is, is unhappy in its own way. Um, but the striking thing is, if you look pat back over the past 150 years of U.S. economic history, there are several patterns that, that are pretty common across recessions and, and subsequent recoveries. One is, is, my colleague Bob Hall would say that the, the pace of the recovery and the unemployment rate is usually pretty steady. Uh, Milton Friedman actually pointed out that usually in US economic history, when you have a really deep recession or contraction, the subsequent expansion is really steep. So he called this his plucking model of business cycles, that the, the amplitude of an expansion of a, of a recovery is very strongly correlated with the amplitude of the, the preceding contraction. And my colleague, Mike Borda, recently had a paper in which he said that that's actually especially true when, when you have a, a recession that's coincident with a financial crisis. So usually when you have a big, deep recession with a financial crisis, you actually come galloping out of it. And, and one, of the, one of the few exceptions to that over the past 150 years of U.S. economic history was the recovery from 2008, 2009, which was the slowest recovery in, in US history. It took 77 or 78 months to recover all the jobs lost in, uh, in 08, 09 versus a post-war average of uh, 23 or 24 months. So, so that was an, an anomalous uh, recovery. And I would certainly hope that if a recession is coming in the next 12 to 24 months, that it is shallow, short, and as a, as a similarly quick recovery. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Well, with that, uh, Aaron, I did. I want to leave you with the last word. Is there anything that we haven't gotten to that uh, that you wanted to mention? 
No, I think we've hit it all. I, I won't put myself out there making a prediction that will be proven wrong in the future. Uh, but I, I do think we're in for a little bit of a bumpy ride here for the next year or so. All right. Well, thank you both. And I will turn it back over to Brenda. Well, I want to thank Tyler and Aaron for a very informative program. I guess we'll sit back and watch, see how all of this plays out. Uh, to learn more about our upcoming events, please visit us at showmeinstitute.org. I want to thank you all again for joining us today and hope you all stay safe. Take care.